So uh, I know I understand this place, even though I have spent the last uh, 30 odd years living in Sydney. I'm a sort of a native here. And oh, in case anybody doesn't know who I am, it's not, I'm not Santa coming early. <laughs> Barry Williams is my name. I'm the executive officer of Australian Skeptics and the editor of our journal, A Skeptic. This is the 21st annual convention we've held. We started in 1985. We held one in Sydney at the Institution of Engineers, and we've had one every year since. Um, and they've spread across the most of the country. Uh, we haven't been to Tasmania or, or uh, Western Australia yet, but we've had them in Brisbane, Adelaide, Newcastle. This is the first time in the Gold Coast, and the second time in Queensland, um, Canberra, Sydney, and Melbourne. And uh, we're trying to. Uh, Somebody suggested last night we get the South Australian, Western Australian and Northern Territory branches together and hold one at Alice Springs. That might take a little bit of organising. But <laughs> Anyway, we, we've been doing this for 21 years and uh, they've usually been very, very successful events. And, uh, and this one looks like being a beauty and congratulations to the Gold Coast people, which is quite a small group for putting all the effort and time and, uh, and into getting this thing running. I'm very, very proud of them um, because... I know Lillian was a little bit worried about whether they could do it, and others in the, the Gold Coast Committee were. And, uh, but you've done it, and it looks like a rip snorter, and I'm very, very happy, and I'm sure everybody else will be, apart from the crap weather. Sorry, <laughs> the weather. Um, and, of course, you probably get nobody, if Australia's forced to follow on tonight, you'll probably get nobody here tomorrow at all, because we'll all d dive into the surf. Um, before I introduce Martin Hadley, who is now the, uh, the president of Australian Skeptics Inc. and the New South Wales branch, um, I'd like to ask you all to switch off your mobile phones, if possible, please, and uh, you may leave your pacemaker switched on if it's absolutely essential. Uh, we want to get the, the, the program underway very quickly uh, because these things have a tendency to run over time. And uh, um, in, to introduce our first speaker, I'll introduce you to Martin Hadley, who was recently elected as president of Australian Skeptics, which is effectively the New South Wales branch. That's the organisation to which I belong. And uh, Martin will... Uh, um, Martin, by the way, is a barrister, and he charges by the word, so... <laughs> He'll be very brief. Martin Hadley. Thank you, Barry. It's very pleasing to see so many people here. Uh, and, uh, of course... We know that many of you uh, have travelled a long way to be here and to, to show your interest by spending uh, important time, your weekend time, at this conference. Uh, the number of people here is a reflection of the fine work done by the Gold Coast branch in organising this conference. And uh, as soon as I saw the program, I could see that it was going to be an excellent conference. Uh, I should apologise, by the way, for this slightly rumpled shirt. I'm on a crusade to save uh, greenhouse gases by not ironing shirts and I, I was assured that the warm, tropical, humid <laughs> climate would, would take out the wrinkles, so, so be it. Um, I um, sometimes think of the sceptics as, as a, a kind of a pyramid, as in you've got a small number of people at the top who do a lot of work and going down through people who show varying amounts of interest and have various amounts of time down through subscribers, down through people who might look occasionally at the website, down through people that we all sort of pester even though they're not subscribers. Um, it's uh, something I'm conscious of. But when, when I was elected president, I nevertheless could see in my New South Wales branch that there are a number of individuals that do a lot of work, a stunning amount of work. I suppose uh, Barry is at the top of our pyramid, as indeed he should be, given what we pay him. Uh, but the... <laughs> The amount of work done by other people with other day jobs is staggering. Richard Saunders is outstanding. He can't be with us this weekend. Uh, and Peter Bowditch. Uh, the, the, the work that these guys put in is just an inspiration. I hope you're keeping a regular eye on the website because it's really kicked off in the last six months. The, the, the work that uh, uh, generally Peter Bowditch does for um, 
uh, or in relation to the website, uh, is excellent. And it's the sort of thing you can often send off pages or links to your friends, even if they're not subscribers, to keep the level of interest up. Uh, I, I should say that as I um, walked out of the front of the hotel and then went back to get my jumper, which I'd thrown in just as an afterthought, I thought, well, maybe the weather, the cold weather, will keep uh, Bowditch out of his tropical shirts, but we'll <laughs> see. <laughs> Um, I haven't got any sort of blinding pains in my eyes, so he doesn't seem to be in the audience. So, ah, this was... ah well, there we are. <laughs> so far, so good. But that, by the way, is an indication of the level of my, um, uh, the standard of my vision. So, if I ever walk straight past you in Sydney, even with glasses on, please don't be offended. Um, when this conference is over, I want you to think about ways of raising the level of interest in people lower down this metaphorical pyramid that I've mentioned. It's obvious that the people in this room here are um, relatively active and relatively interested. Um, but I try to, to get other people interested. I've got a number of friends. A couple of them have become subscribers in the last six months. I've exploited being president to put the hard word on a few of them. Um, you're probably in the same position. You've got acquaintances. Now, we don't like to, to um, harass people, but I want you to look out for opportunities to send them bits of information, emails, whatever. And what it leads to is that they start to become aware, they become more aware of the organisation. And you'll find that every now and then they'll come up to you, uh, maybe with a bit of a smirk and say things like, well, how does, you know, what do the sceptics think about such and such? And most of the time they're, they're hoping for a slightly humorous or cynical line on things, um, but often they're just genuinely interested as to what we say as a source of authoritative information. And to my way of thinking, every time that happens, it's a bit of a victory. So while this conference is uh, taking place, I, I want you to appreciate the, the amount of work that's gone into to organise it. And when the conference is over, I, I'd ask you to think of ways of getting people further down the pyramid who probably aren't subscribers a little bit more interested in what we do. Having said that, it's now my uh, privilege to introduce one of the people who's very, very, very far up our pyramid, Dr Colin Kay. Um, a lot of you would know a great deal about him from having seen his articles in the magazine over various years. You've, you may have seen him speak at previous conventions. We have for this convention excellent biographical information uh, about our speakers. I, I won't repeat any of that. Let me just say Colin is a very fine man and a uh, a regular and staunch contributor to our magazine, and it's my great pleasure to welcome him to uh, be our next... That's my uh, clock radio, by the way, or my, my um, travelling clock falling down the lectern. And we put it here because there's no timing device here, so uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Colin to be our next speaker. And if the technological people can just help me get <laughs> unwired, I'll try and make a dignified exit. Thank you all. Mm. Good morning, fellow sceptics. Those of you who are Queenslanders have had a very rude shock, and I believe a lot fewer of you will be believing in global warming. <laughs> Before I go any further, I must pay tribute to the fantastic work that's been done in recent months by Lillian and Mike and Max and her other, their, her other helpers in organising what is very suggests will be a very positive and profitable convention. I might also add that uh, as a humble scientist, my word charges are much cheaper than those of my predecessor. <laughs> what, somebody's charging me by the hour, are they? <laughs> well, as for the theme of this uh, convention, the power of critical thought, that's what scepticism is all about, and that's thinking critically of what's going on around us, particularly being sensitive to the various scams and opportunistic devices that are being employed by members of the uh, greater public whose um, financial morality leaves a lot to be desired. It's not for nothing that uh, we sceptics refer to the various psychic fairs and that is mind, body and wallet festivals. <laughs> well, 
one of the themes of this convention, which is um, I'm going to stress, is that this is the Einstein year. And being a physical scientist myself, Einstein, of course, is one of my heroes. This year is the centenary of the Annus Mirabilis of physics, the miracle year of physics, when Einstein quite literally turned the science of physics on its head. He has uh, influenced me to the extent of uh, improving my hairstyle, but I've drawn the line at a bushy soup strainer moustache. I didn't feel I could quite emulate that. However, there was a little poem in one of the physics journals earlier this year which I just must share with you. An eminent family named Stein had members Epp, Gert and Ein. <laughs> Epp's sculptures were junk, Gert's poems were bunk, but no one was quite sure about Ein. <laughs> well, I think Einstein would have made a very healthy sceptic from, particularly from some of his many sayings, which have been gathered together in a, a few uh, delightful books uh, published by the Princeton University Press. And as you know, Einstein resided in, Prin in Princeton for the final 30 years or so of his life. In Alice Calaprese's collection or compilation of Einstein's many sayings, hundreds of them, all worthy of being read, and as one reviewer said, better than any autobiography. Here's one of them. He said, when I was young, I found out that the big toe always ends up making a hole in a sock. <laughs> so I stopped wearing socks. He goes on, falling in love is not at all the most stupid thing that people do, but gravitation cannot be held responsible for it. <laughs> and one little appeal to some of our hardened sceptics, the mystical trend of our present time, especially evident in the enthusiastic growth of so-called theosophy and spiritualism, is to me a sign of weakness. Since our inner experiences consist of reproductions and combinations of sensory impressions, the concept of a soul without a body seems to me to be empty and devoid of meaning. Spoken like a true skeptic. As for Einstein's belief in God, Einstein did not believe at all in a personal God but he acknowledged the presence of some greater force in the universe than we have yet uh, discovered or understood. But he does hurl a brickbat or two at personal, the concept of a personal God. He says, I see only with regret that God punishes so many of his children for their numerous stupidities for which he himself can be held responsible. In my opinion, only his non-existence could excuse him. <laughs> and particularly applicable is Einstein's remark when listening to long-winded speeches at a dinner, he said quietly to those near him at the table, he said, I just got a new theory of eternity. So, after that sage advice from one of the greatest people who ever lived, I'll quit ahead of time, I hope, and declare the convention open. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.